Good evening. Tonight's story is Hans Humdrum from Danish Fairy and Folk Tales, translated by Jens Christian Bay and published in 1899. Bay collectively credits original authors Sven Grundtvig, E. T. Christensen, Ingvor Bondesen, and L. Bode, but does not attribute specific stories to specific authors, so the original writer of Hans Humdrum is unclear. This story features a troll who needs to be infuriated and the very man for the job. It's a bit ridiculous, a bit violent, and a bit strange, like all proper old folk tales should be. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Once there were a man and his wife who owned a very small farm. They had three sons. The eldest was called Peter, the second Paul, and the third Hans, who was considered somewhat feeble-minded and was, therefore, generally called Hans Humdrum. As the boys grew up, it became more and more difficult for their parents to provide for them, and when they were grown and too large to run errands for the neighbors, they were obliged to go further away and take such service as they might find. Peter, the oldest, went away first. He received a shirt, a pair of stockings, and a large parcel of bread and butter, and, having bid his parents goodbye, he started on his journey. When he had walked a couple of miles, he met a man who was driving along in great style, and who stopped, inquiring where Peter was going. The boy replied that he was seeking a place where he might secure work. "'I have just left home to find someone to serve me,' answered the man. "'Would you care to take the place?' "'How much wages will you pay?' inquired Peter. "'The wages were a bushel of dollars for six months' service. "'Before engaging you,' pursued the man, "'I wish to have a clear agreement. "'When the cock crows in the morning, "'you must go to work and do all that I say. "'I like to keep my servants as long as possible, "'but from the beginning I engage them only for six months.' and by the time the cuckoo begins to tune his voice, our agreement is over. Then there is one more thing. I am disposed myself to be glad and contented, and do not like to have sour faces around me. Therefore I agree with my hired men that he who first becomes angry shall have a sound thrashing. If I become angry first, I at once give the man his wages, and he may go. But if he shows ill temper first, I give him his whipping and then throw him out of the door. Peter considered this a singular agreement, so he thought it over before entering upon it. The man was not at all good-looking. His mouth reached as far as his ears on both sides, and never had Peter seen a nose of such size and length. But as he smiled pleasantly and blinked so joyfully with his small, half-closed eyes, the boy thought that he was, perhaps, only playing a joke on him. Besides, the wages were extraordinarily high. He closed the agreement and at once entered upon his duties. Climbing into the carriage, he drove along with the man until they reached the farm where his future master lived. As it was towards evening when they arrived, Peter at once went to bed and slept soundly. At six o'clock next morning the cock began to crow. Peter was dressed and at work in the barn before long threshing wheat, according to directions given by his master on the previous night. He worked an hour, and still another, but no one called him to the breakfast table. At length he laid down his flail and walked across the yard into his master's dwelling room. The man was sitting at the end of the table, but no breakfast was to be seen anywhere. Peter's mistress was, if possible, still more ugly than her husband. She was cross-eyed, and two long teeth reached far out of her mouth. A great many small, dirty children were crawling about everywhere. They fought one another, and yelled at the top of their voices. It looked as if they had already had their breakfast, but there seemed to be none for him. "'Are you hungry, Peter?' asked the farmer, winking and blinking and twinkling at him with his small eyes, until they almost seemed to disappear within the lids. "'Yes,' answered Peter. "'Of course I'm hungry. 
I had no supper last night and no breakfast this morning, and I may well need it, as I've been threshing over two hours. Look at the writing above the door, Peter, continued the troll, for, of course, he was a troll and no real farmer. Look above the door and see what is written there. Peter looked and read the following words, No breakfast until tomorrow. As he looked sorely disappointed, the troll continued, Are you angry, Peter? No, certainly not, answered he, skulking away, quite abashed. Fortunately, he had kept a piece of bread and butter. It now served him for breakfast, while he said to himself, For one day such a freak matters little. Of course, Master wishes to put me to a test, and tomorrow I can eat twice as much. He threshed on until nightfall when he went to bed with a hungry stomach. Next morning the cock crowed at four o'clock. The sooner we will have our breakfast, thought Peter, hurrying into his clothes and hastening to his work in the barn. Soon the flail began to move, but every little while he stopped and listened if anyone called him for breakfast. Every second minute he opened the door and looked out, expecting to see someone appear and call him in but no one came. At six o'clock he put his flail aside and went over to the house. Everything looked as on the previous evening. At breakfast he saw nothing at all, and his master was sitting at the end of the table, looking pleased and satiated, while his wife made a great noise with the many children, who did not seem to suffer from want of food. "'Are you hungry, Peter?' asked the farmer, grinning all over his ugly face. I suppose I ought to be hungry by this time, answered the boy. Yesterday I had nothing to eat, and today I've been working two mortal hours. Yes, I ought to be hungry indeed. Look at the writing above the door, Peter, continued the farmer, smiling blandly at him. Peter read the same words as on the day before. No breakfast until tomorrow. Yes, he said. This is tomorrow, and I am tired of such foolishness. One cannot work without eating. You are not angry, I suppose, resumed the farmer, just as kindly as before. Yes, and Peter swore to it, he was angry, for that was not the right way to treat the servants. Well, said the troll, no doubt you remember the agreement between us. In less time than it can be told, Peter received as sound a thrashing as he had ever dreamed of, and the next moment he found himself outside of the gate, sore all over his body, and hardly able to walk away. It took him many days to return home, and he was obliged to stay in bed for quite a length of time. His parents gave him no consolation, but told him he had behaved himself in a wrong manner. No doubt his master had only wished to put him to a test— a bushel of dollars was too good wages to throw away in such a careless manner. Paul now set out to find his place. He had a large package of bread and butter and his clothes in a bundle, and when he followed the road which Peter had pointed out for him, he was fortunate enough to meet the farmer who came driving along. He stopped and asked Paul where he was going, and when he learned that the boy was seeking a place, he offered him one. The agreement was the same as in Peter's case. Paul worked hard for three days and received neither bite nor sip. Finally, he lost his patience, received his thrashing, and returned home in a miserable state. While the old folks doctored their two oldest sons, cursing the cruel master, Hans Humdrum went around and said nothing. One morning he was gone, no one knew where. He knew it himself, however, for he followed the road described by Peter and Paul, and as luck would have it, he happened to meet the old farmer with the long nose and the smiling face. When he stopped and inquired where Hans was going, he offered him a place on his farm. "'How much wages will you pay?' inquired Hans. "'I will give you a bushel of dollars for six months' service,' answered the man, repeating the agreement which we already know. "'We will get on pleasantly together,' declared Hans. 
I hope so, answered the troll, and laughed so heartily that Hans could see all his long teeth. You will stay with me until the cuckoo tunes his voice. Then our agreement is fulfilled, if we do not part earlier. Every morning when the cock crows you must arise, and you will have to do all that I tell you. Yes, Hans was willing enough to agree upon this, and so they drove on together. They reached the farm, and without receiving any supper, Hans slept during the whole night in the room which his brothers had occupied before him. At six o'clock the next morning the cock crowed. Hans arose and went to the barn, as he was told. When he had worked for an hour without being called to breakfast, he went to the house where the fine-looking troll family was assembled. The troll himself was sitting at the end of the table. His wife rested in the chimney corner, and all the ugly children were romping about the room. "'Good morning,' said Hans. "'It's time for breakfast, is it not?' "'Our agreement says nothing about that,' replied the other. "'But read what it says above the door.' Hans was no ready reader, but at length he succeeded in spelling out the words No breakfast until tomorrow. Tomorrow is far ahead, said Hans, and we may think of that when the time comes. You may look to the rye for your breakfast, remarked the troll, grinning at the boy who was retreating through the door. Hans made no reply, but returned to his work threshing rye. Towards dinner time he filled a sack with rye and carried it to an innkeeper who lived in the neighborhood, and to whom Hans said, My master and I have agreed that I shall receive no breakfast at the house. He has told me to look to the rye. Will you board me for this bushel of rye? The innkeeper was willing to do this, and Hans received an excellent meal and provisions besides in his scrip. Upon this, he returned to his work. As it happened the first day, it did on the following days also. The letters above the door were always the same, but Hans was as complacent and obedient as when he entered upon his duties. The troll asked him each morning, "'You are not angry, Hans?' The boy promptly answered, "'No, I have no reason to be angry.' On the fourth morning, when Hans came into the room, and the farmer showed him the letters above the door, he turned around, intending to return to the barn, when the troll asked, "'Are you not angry, Hans?' "'No,' answered he, "'not particularly. "'Have you had nothing to eat for these three days?' continued the troll. "'Yes,' replied Hans, "'I had all that I needed.' I looked to the rye, as Master said. The innkeeper is willing enough to give me all that I need for a bushel of rye every day. What do you say? shouted the troll. I hope Master is not angry with me, pursued Hans. Uh, No, no, by no means, eagerly returned the troll. But you had better leave the threshing and do something else. Uh, You'd better plow some of the fields. "'Load the plough on a wagon and drive out. "'My dog will go in front of you. "'Where he lies down, you must begin ploughing, "'and when he returns home, you must follow him back to the house.' "'Hans obeyed, but toward noon he began to feel hungry. "'As the dog remained lying in the grass "'and seemed to have no intentions of moving, "'the boy seized his whip and reached him a good blow across the back, "'which caused him to jump up and run homeward at great speed.' Hans skipped down, cut the traces, jumped on the horse again, and rode after the dog at a furious rate. When they reached the house, the animal jumped the garden fence, and Hans followed him promptly. Unfortunately, one of the horses fell and broke his leg, however, and the other one ran into one of the hedge stakes. Thus both horses were disabled. The troll, who heard the uproar, came running out, but Hans said, I acted upon your instructions, master. I followed the dog, and here we are. You're not angry, I hope, because both of our horses were spoiled. Nonsense, replied the troll. No, I'm I'm not angry. Come in and have some dinner. He really began to be afraid of the boy who obeyed him so literally. 
Hans received both dinner and supper, and the next morning he was ordered to tend the swine. There were about fifty of them, and beautiful, fat animals they were. "'Let them go wherever they wish,' said the troll, "'even if they want to root themselves into the ground.' "'All right,' cried Hans, driving the swine out of the yard. When he had followed them a short distance, he met a couple of men who traveled about, buying up cattle and swine. The men stopped and inquired whether these animals were for sale. "'To be sure they are,' replied Hans. "'All except the old sow yonder. She is intended for a present for our minister.' Soon the price was fixed, and Hans received a sum of money which he put into his pocket. When the two men had driven all of the animals away except the old sow, he took her to a marsh, where she soon buried herself in the mud, leaving only her tail above the ground. Hans, however, returned to the house. "'What has become of the swine?' inquired the troll. "'They went straight into the peat bog, master,' answered Hans. And they are all down there except the old sow, which I tried to stop. Her tail is yet above the ground, but all the rest of the animals are gone. The troll hastened along to the place, followed by Hans. Now the troll bent down, seized the sow's tail, and tried to pull her out. The tail slipped out of his hands, however, and he tumbled into the water. When he came out again, he ran around furiously, trying to find his swine, but, as Hans said, they were already far away. I hope that Master is not angry with me, said Hans. No, he was not at all angry, he asserted. When the troll returned home, he said to his wife, How in the world can I get rid of this wretch? He will ruin and spoil our whole property. Oh, how I wish I could cool my rage upon him. But I must keep our agreement, even if it costs all that I have. I have an idea, cried his wife. I think I know how we may get rid of him. He knows that his time is up when the cuckoo begins to tune his voice. Of course, it will be long before that time comes, but we may deceive him. You tar me and roll me in feathers until I look like a bird, and then help me up into the large apple tree where I will cry cuckoo, cuckoo, until he thinks that the cuckoo has really come. You are a cunning woman, answered the troll admiringly. It shall be as you say. Upon this they retired, well pleased. Next morning Hans and the troll were sitting at the breakfast table. The woman was outside, when all at once they heard the cuckoo chant from the apple tree, Cuckoo! Cuckoo! Listen, said the troll, the cuckoo has come. I must see him, exclaimed Hans, jumping up and running out of the door. I always used to have a look at the first cuckoo in the summer. When he came into the garden, he seized a sharp flint stone and threw it at the head of the old woman who was sitting in the tree cuckooing with all her might. She fell to the ground at once, stone dead. Come, master, called Hans. Come and look at this wonderful cuckoo. The troll at once came running, and when he saw what had happened, he began to curse and swear with such force that sparks flew from both of his eyes. "'Master is not angry, I hope,' said the boy. "'You great scoundrel!' yelled the troll furiously. "'Yes, yes, I am! I am so furious, raving mad that I feel like bursting with rage. Now you know it! You sold my rye!' You spoiled my horses and swine, and now you've killed my wife! Ho, ho, ho! And he was fairly shaking and trembling with fury. Well, said Hans, quietly, we must deal with each other according to our agreement. So he seized the troll and thrashed him until he was hardly able to stir. When this was done, he walked into the house, took the bushel of dollars which was due him, returning home with it. He lived long and happily with his parents and his brothers, and they saw or heard no more of the troll. And so, the troll is defeated through sheer stubbornness and a kind of clever fatuity. It's a shame the wife had to die, though. She didn't make the bargain. 
And it's such a weird premise for a story that these two characters can basically do whatever they like to each other as long as no one admits being angry. So they spend the whole story like testing and trying each other. It's a really interesting idea actually. It centers the character's emotion in a way that old stories very seldom do. I also think this story is compelling because we don't get any insight into Hans's inner life. He is introduced as being feeble-minded, and he never speaks to anyone in his family at all. His first few interactions with the troll can be interpreted as a kind of stupidity, but then it becomes clear that he is not stupid at all. Jens Christian Bay is an interesting character, and I wish I knew more about him. He was born in Denmark, he went to the University of Copenhagen, and he immigrated to the U.S. when he was 19 to work at the Missouri Botanical Gardens in St. Louis. Then somehow he got a job at the Library of Congress, and eventually he became a chief librarian at the University of Chicago. Along the way, he became an expert and an author on a truly astounding array of subjects, including rare books, botany, English literature, Danish literature, the history of the American Midwest. He wrote numerous books, both fiction and nonfiction, in Danish and in English, on a huge range of subjects. Late in life, he was awarded the Order of the Dannebrog by King Frederick IX of Denmark, and he became a knight. His first book, however, was this translation of Danish fairy tales, which actually echoes the career of Baroness Orzi, as we discussed a couple weeks ago. One more odd little fact about Jens Christian Bay, he was born in Rukuring, a little village with a population of about 4,500 people, about 3,500 in his time. And actor Nikolai Kosterwalda also comes from that town, as did the physicist who discovered the connection between electricity and magnetism. Who knew? This book was illustrated, as you've seen in the video, but I've been unable to figure out who did these drawings. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, I make a little confession. This week's confession is that I am recording this story early because I will be in Denmark when it goes live. I love Denmark and I wanted to celebrate the occasion with some literature from that country, but thanks to Hans Christian Andersen, Danish fairy tales are among the most famous in the whole world, and that is not what we do around here. I was really happy to find this book from Bay, which had a number of stories in it that were new to me, and I really enjoyed reading it. And a shout out to my friend Anna Meta, who did her best to help me pronounce Rude Kubing. <laughs> This is Restored Lore, where we celebrate obscure old literature and seek out odd and unusual stories from around the world. If you enjoyed this story and you want to hear more, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and share it if you think it's worth sharing. We will be celebrating spooky season starting next week, and you do not want to miss it.